Cody. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Clayton Naff. He's here uh, with Lincoln Literacy. He's going to uh, tell us all about that. And then I've got some questions for him too. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Brooke. And let me start by thanking Noah for inviting me in the first place. It's delightful to be with you. Uh, I'm going to attempt to share. Whoa, no, don't want to do that. I'm going to try to share my screen and uh, show you a slideshow so you don't have to look at me silhouetted against the backdrop of my windows. Okay. Are you seeing my screen now? You see your desktop. Okay, let's see. Da, 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 da. I'm gonna back out and try again. How that works, right? You get used to Zoom and then you don't use it for a while and you stop getting used to it. And now you're like, what? There we go. Now yeah. we can see it. Hooray. Okay. Uh, so I have to warn you that Brooke and her instructions sort of encouraged me to share about myself. If I start oversharing, somebody just give me the symbol. <laughs> so I am an American. I was born in California, but when I was just a little under two years old, my dad got a scholarship to study at the University of London. And so I'm so old that we took a boat across the Atlantic. They're actually, the Wright brothers had flown their plane. There were flights, but for some reason, <laughs> we caught one of the last uh, transatlantic passenger ships uh, to get to England. And that's my late mother there carrying me on the ship. Uh, and then uh, after my dad completed his studies there, he ended up taking a job at the American University in Cairo. Uh, we ended up living there for six years. Uh, that's my grandmother who came to visit. And uh, we went for a ride on a camel by the Great Pyramids uh, out, just outside, at that time, just outside Cairo. Now I think Cairo has engulfed them. Uh, so why do I tell you this? Well. I had no idea, but this was actually preparing me for the career that I would have much later in life. While I was going to school in Egypt, kids my age were watching Mr. Ed and the Jetsons. Yay! <laughs> when we moved back to the States, of course, I spoke English fluently. It was my native language. I spoke Arabic pretty well at the time. I've now forgotten almost all of it. Uh, but culturally, I was just as uh, in the dark as anybody who'd arrived here from another country. I had to quickly learn about these TV shows that I'd never seen because that's what kids talked about on the playground. So to this day, I know about some TV shows that I have still never seen, like My Mother the Car. I don't know oh, many yeah. details, but it was popular at the time. Many, many years later, I had the privilege of becoming executive director of Lincoln Literacy, a nonprofit organization here in Lincoln that serves people from all over the world, including from right here. But the majority of people that we serve are immigrants and refugees. However, there's another little subtext to my story. When I grew up, uh, well, I was still in my teens, but I had a chance to go back to Egypt and while I was there, I worked as an assistant to the Time Magazine correspondent in Cairo. Wow. And that got me started on a career in journalism. Uh, after another 10 years or so completing college, uh, I got the itch to go overseas. And I was lucky enough to be able to go to Japan and be a journalist there in my own right. So I spent another six years in Japan in my 30s. And that was a truly humbling experience, especially at the beginning. Uh, as a child, I learned Arabic just like a sponge soaks up water. And almost all kids can do this. It's one of the gifts of nature to us that as children, uh, we learn language effortlessly. As adults, it's a very different story. I studied intensively for two and a half years before I moved to Japan, and I also immersed myself in books about the history and culture of the nation. And when I got there, I found I was pretty much helpless at first. 
after a really painful first year, I eventually became just competent enough to do my job as a journalist. I still had to rely on translators often to uh, clarify fine points for me. And throughout my years there, I continued to find new aspects of the culture, usually by violating some customer <laughs> dress or taboo uh, that I still didn't know about. It really taught me humility. And again, unknowingly, it prepared me for the job that I do now, which is a wonderful, uplifting job, heading this dynamic community organization that really does serve people from all over the world. Uh, we did a census a few years ago and found that uh, we had just over 70 different nationalities and territories represented in our student body, uh, including, as I say, from just down the block. Uh, we serve any adult who uh, wants our services. And we do that through the good offices of volunteer tutors who go through a training program with us and then meet individually or in small classes uh, with adults who need to learn basic skills at first typically becoming fluent and literate in the English language. For the much smaller number of Americans who come to our classes, it's to work on their basic reading and writing skills and sometimes math and others. I'll explain the rest of that later. But first I wanna put this in perspective because after all, you're all interested in entrepreneurship and the business community in Lincoln. And so I imagine that you're aware that the work that we do takes place in a context that is in some ways quite alarming. We have what others have called a workforce crisis and its epicenter is right here in Lincoln. I'm sure I'm not breaking news to you when I say that we have an unprecedented 1.1% unemployment rate here in Lincoln. There are at last count about nine open jobs for every job seeker uh, and that means that virtually every entity is trying, struggling to hire. Of course, that includes the businesses of Lincoln, but it also includes uh, public safety. It includes the healthcare sector. Uh, it includes nonprofits like my own. Uh, it's a really difficult time. And frankly, it came to me as a shock because in August of 2020, uh, we had an unprecedented spike in unemployment as the first wave of the COVID pandemic resulted in many layoffs. Uh, just a year later, the pendulum had swung all the way over and it's continued to move toward a tighter and tighter labor market. And this is not likely to change soon. Uh, the baby boomers, uh, some of whom I'm talking to, and I certainly count myself as one, uh, are retiring in larger and larger numbers every year. And that's expected to continue at least until the end of this decade. So where will Lincoln and the rest of our state and nation uh, find the workers that it needs to fill vital jobs throughout our economy? Well, I suppose it's always possible that all of California will move to Nebraska and solve our problem, <laughs> but I don't think that's highly likely or even necessarily desirable. Uh, what we do have here is a resource in our international population, uh, which has grown over the last two decades uh, in, with some fluctuation uh, in the last administration, uh, refugee resettlement and immigration were all but halted. Uh, it, since then, the pandemic has uh, inhibited the flow of uh, people across international borders, but it's begun to resume with the uh, resettlement of Afghans fleeing the Taliban, especially Afghans who had helped US forces in Afghanistan. Uh, and they're coming to a place that's already well prepared to receive and settle them. Lincoln has long been a welcoming city. Uh, we were noted for that in 2013. Uh, our present and past mayors have proclaimed us a welcoming city to people from other countries. 
And I'm proud to say that Lincoln Literacy plays a pivotal role in turning that impulse to welcome into a practical reality. Our mission is to strengthen our community by teaching the English language and a variety of literacy skills to people of all cultures. And here you see at left, uh, one of our wonderful tutors uh, now on staff uh, with a young woman from Sri Lanka in Southeast Asia. She had been a teacher in her home country and we helped her get on the road to becoming a teacher in Nebraska. Uh, I'll say more about that in a moment, but the basic uh, services that we provide uh, for most people have to do with mastering the English language. We're not an academy or a school. We are a community of learning and caring. And that care is expressed most of all by our volunteer tutors. Uh, it's what makes for successful learning experiences because uh, traditional ways of learning uh, are really difficult to implement across many different cultures where styles of education vary tremendously. And indeed the provision of education to people varies wildly. Some of the people that we uh, serve come from countries where everybody gets a chance at a really good basic education and higher education for many. Others deprive people of education, particularly women. And women are two thirds of our student body. Some of them come from countries where they have been systematically denied even a basic elementary education. We can help them through the good offices of our volunteer tutors. Thanks to them, we're able to offer classes seven days a week, mornings, afternoons, and evenings. Uh, since the pandemic began, uh, we had to shift everything online and we have restarted in-person classes in fits and starts. Uh, we just went through another painful closure for about 10 days in January, but now we're back to offering both online and in-person learning opportunities. And through those, we're able to serve more than a thousand people a year. Starting in about the mid 2010s, uh, as more data about poverty in Lincoln and the employment opportunities and scarcities of trained workers became evident, we started to raise our sights. We recognized that with online learning resources, our volunteer tutors didn't have to know everything that they would be able to teach. Uh, they just had to be able to access it and share it with our students. So we started asking ourselves, how can we go beyond the basics and help people gain skills that will ensure them an opportunity for living wage jobs? And if they are ready for it, a career path. We started with a CNA prep class, uh, which meets a very uh, critically short field, uh, a, a very in-demand field, the certified nursing aid. And uh, we were amazed to find that health professionals, mostly but not all retired, uh, came to volunteer to teach this class. So we had envisioned that we'd need to rely on online teaching tools exclusively, but as it happened, we had doctors and nurses and uh, physician's assistants and CNAs all volunteering as tutors. So this has turned into a highly successful class. About 90% of the students who've completed our CNA prep class have then gone on to succeed in the accredited CNA class at either Southeast Community College or Bryan College of Health Sciences and pass the state certification exam. You might wonder how that compares with those who go directly into one of those accredited programs. I can tell you that the failure rate for uh, CNA classes at Southeast Community College is about 70%. Wow. To flip that over, we have about a 90% success rate compared with about a 30% success rate without the prep class and the individual tutoring that our volunteers provide throughout the accredited class. 
In 2020, just as the pandemic was closing in, we took that initiative and several others that we had started, and we integrated them all into a concept called the Bridgeway to a Better Life. And we were fortunate that year to win uh, the Breakthrough Initiative of the Year uh, Award from Woods Charitable Fund, which came with three years of funding to build on these beginnings to create something really durable that would help people first master the basic skills that they need, and then go across one of many avenues along that bridgeway to a better life toward uh, the occupation of their choice or the career path of their choice with the aim of lifting themselves and their families out of poverty and helping them to achieve their dreams and inspire their children. So we've done that in a number of fields now. This is our first class through the CNA prep program. They all passed. They were an extraordinary class because most of them had been medical professionals in their home countries. Uh, and they uh, sailed through the class, but could not have done it, they told us, without our help, because many of the terms are unfamiliar, hard to translate, and much of the jargon that surrounds them is really difficult to decode if you're not a native English speaker. So since then, uh, we've added to the Bridgeway to a Better Life. Uh, in addition to language and literacy skills, we found we needed to put some basic essential skills classes for adults ahead of the career path classes. Uh, as Jody well knows, many people need to master financial literacy before they can plan a higher education program for themselves. Uh, others needed to just get to understand how to use a computer. Uh, almost all of them have used a smartphone, but that's not quite the same as mastering computer skills that you'll need to pass online tests and for many other purposes. Uh, some of them need to get a GED before they go on. So we created a GED prep class. And similar to the uh, CNA prep class, the failure rates for people who either study on their own for a GED or who go to a sort of traditional uh, prep class for GED are staggering. They're way above 80%. Uh, with the kind of highly personal, self-paced, uh, and mutually encouraging prep classes that we offer, uh, the success rate is a great deal higher. We've had it's slow, but we've had all of the students who've gone through that pass some portion of the GED uh, test so far, and they're progressing toward completing all of it. Uh, beyond that, we've created a pathway to become a teacher for those who are educators in their home countries. And subsequently, we created a paraeducator prep class for those who might not be able to go all the way to become a teacher, but want to have a role in the classroom. Uh, our prep class uh, gives them the basics that they need to apply to Lincoln Public Schools, for example. Uh, we also have a commercial driver's license prep class for those who want to drive a bus or a truck. Uh, we work with the Lincoln Partnership uh, for Economic Development in a manufacturing seminar that they created, uh, and we help with the English language learners who want to go through that. We just placed one of the Afghan refugees into that so that he can uh, qualify for a job at Kawasaki or uh, TMCO or one of the other great manufacturing companies that we have in our area. So what do we achieve overall? I mentioned that we are able to serve more than a thousand people a year thanks to our volunteer tutors. We have year in and year out very high satisfaction rates. Among the students, they're over 95% uh, in the last several years. And among the tutors, they're steadily above 90%. We achieve high rates of student progress. We do pre and post testing according to the type of study that they're engaged in. And better than 80% a year of our adult learners uh, score measurable progress. Uh, about two thirds of them achieve their particular goal for that year. It might be improving their English by a level on a standardized exam. It might be achieving uh, the CNA 
or passing a portion of the GED exam, but whatever goal they've set, about two thirds of them attain that within each year. And perhaps most important, we start out with people who are almost all unemployed or underemployed. And between 25 and 40% of our students uh, go on to get a job thanks to the services that we provide. At the end of 2021, we surveyed our students and 39% of them told us that through our services, they had gotten a job in the last year. We asked them uh, if they were earning $15 an hour or more as a measure of living wage. And of that group, 72% were at $15 an hour or above in their jobs. So that really, helps us to feel that what we're doing is not just satisfying, it's genuinely meaningful. It's meaningful, of course, for the people who do that and uh, for their families, but it's meaningful for our community as well because we have such a shortage of skilled workers and uh, the people that we serve are really eager to work and really thankful for the chance to be here. So they make wonderful employees in most cases. However, it's still difficult for an English language learner from another culture to uh, find their way in the American workplace. So we've extended our services a little further. We're working with several major employers to help their English language learner employees to succeed in the workplace. We're doing that mainly by teaching the contextual English they need to know in that workplace. So we're doing that at Bryan Health, uh, helping them to understand, for example, the codes that come out from time to time. It might be anything from a patient in distress to a tornado warning. Uh, all the employees there have to know how, what those codes are and how to respond to them. And we help the English language learners to master that. We're also working at Kawasaki, which is hiring, I think, more than 200 people a month at present. Many of those are English language learners. So we're helping them to learn the essential terms that are used in that workplace. And believe me, many of them are puzzling to a guy like me, who's a lifelong English speaker, but uh, words that seem uh, to have an ordinary meaning have a real special meaning in that workplace. So it does take some highly specific training. Uh, we, what we're really pleased about, apart from the satisfaction of those that we serve and of our volunteers, is that the community support for us has really grown over the years. I like to think we've been entrepreneurial in the sense that we've tried to see what our niche in the community is. What can we do to meet actual and evolving community needs? I think we've done pretty well at that, and I'm really pleased that the community has responded by uh, giving us a growing share of uh, our income from contributions from the community. Uh, most of the last five years, we've ended up in the top 10 in, on Give to Lincoln Day among more than 400 nonprofits seeking contributions that day. But at the end of it all, oops, sorry, the most important thing that we do is lift families out of poverty and help them achieve their dreams. When they succeed, we all benefit. Most recently, we've begun helping the Afghans who fled the Taliban. And unlike most refugees uh, who go through a long waiting period, typically five years before they're admitted as refugees to the US, these are people who one day were living what seemed to them a stable and ordinary life and the next day we're at Kabul airport trying desperately to catch a plane out of there and then found themselves in military bases, US military bases for several months while they got vaccinated and uh, the government figured out where they could be placed. Uh, starting in mid-October, we began to receive them here in Lincoln and many of them are now coming to our classes and some of them are making use of our job mentor services to help them uh, find jobs in the community because they're only assured of 90 days of support. After that, they're expected oh. to be self-sufficient. It's not a realistic hope, to be honest, oh, uh, for most of them. Days? Oh, yeah, that's, that's standard refugee 
service. And if you think it's insane, tell your elected officials because they're the ones I who will. they're the ones who decided it. Refugees have to uh, be in the country for at least five years before they can apply for citizenship. So they don't. They only get ninety days to go. Oh my gosh! Yeah, that's insane. It is very tough, uh, but they have great spirit. They're universally grateful to be here. Uh, many of them have been volunteering to help others. Uh, the ones who are, have more English are helping those who have less. Uh, Afghans who are here earlier have come out to volunteer to help the new arrivals. It's a very gratifying experience uh, to work with them. I knew nothing much about Afghan culture before I started meeting them, but I've been delighted to get to know them. And I think our community will really be enriched by their presence. Uh, for example, the young man on the right, he was a civil engineer uh, in Afghanistan. He went to work for US forces uh, about eight years ago, helped to design and oversee the building of bases and roads. And uh, along with his one brother and two sisters uh, had to flee here. He's eager to put his skills to work in Lincoln. And right now he's studying English and uh, has asked for our help to apply to Southeast Community College so he can uh, refresh his credentials here because Afghan credentials in engineering won't be recognized here, but he's got the training and he's got the desire. And I think he'll be a really valuable asset to our community in years to come. So thank you for listening to my life story, such as it is. And to the story of Lincoln Literacy, and I'd be really happy to talk with you about it. Yeah, I have a, a couple of questions that I, I do too. Yep, I, <laughs> right. um, this is something I want to know about all of our speakers. So first thing I would like, um, do you have the best piece of advice you've ever received? Yes. Or favorite quote or something that was just very motivational to you uh, in your journey? I've got a little bit of both. Um, when I was young, uh, I was ambitious and restless, and uh, I was fortunate. I was able to do a lot of interesting things, uh, but it wasn't until I got to be about 30, I guess, uh, that uh, somebody who I look on as a mentor, after I had, I had done something uh, less than honorable at work, and this person sat me down and said, look, you think you're, of yourself as a good person, don't you? And I said, yes. And he said, just remember, you are what you do. So make sure you do the right thing. And I really took that and I felt terribly ashamed of what I had done. And I was grateful for that advice. And I've really tried to imbibe it. And so I've made ethics the center of our work plan at Lincoln Literacy. And every new employee, we start with the mission and then we talk about the ethics and what they imply for how we work with each other. And I've been very gratified that young people who've worked here have thanked me for that after an internship or uh, spending a year with us and, and said that really helped them because it's true. <laughs> it's, it should be obvious, but when you're young, it's not always obvious. <laughs> you are what you do. If you wanna think that you're an honest person, you gotta be honest. If you think you're reliable, you have to be reliable. But that was a very important lesson for me. Uh, my favorite quote, is Martin Luther King Jr. said, everyone can be great because everyone can serve. And that didn't become vividly meaningful until I'd worked here a while, but I have seen people come to us as volunteers who are in great distress. Uh, one of them had worked in banking for 30 years and uh, those of you who've been here a while will remember that Tier 1 Bank collapsed in scandal, and that's where she worked at the time, and suddenly her job was gone, and she came to volunteer with us, and she was like a wilting flower that just revived, and I've seen over and over again that volunteering is a really uplifting experience for the volunteer, as well as for the person who receives the benefit. So a uh, few of us can win a medal or uh, you know, a prize, but 
I think the willingness to serve is a really enriching thing in life. And uh, the way that a person serves will vary according to interests and experience and all of that. But I now encourage everybody I know, but especially the people who are feeling troubled in life to get out there and volunteer. I, I think it really is a great thing to do. Love that, thank you. Um, what do you do to get or stay motivated or perked up as we call it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very fortunate in that way because I do get discouraged. I do get frustrated at times, especially the past two years. Uh, it, it feels at times like the virus is just toying with us. <laughs> you know? Yes. But every time I visit one of our classes, whether it's online or in person, I always think I have nothing to complain about. Look at the conditions that the people who are coming to our classes are weathering and look at how much joy they're taking in just the simple uh, act of friendship that our volunteers have extended. And I'm not alone in this. I, I have a colleague in the next door office and we've said it dozens of times. It's just the mission that we have and the activities that, uh, that make that mission real are just so reviving and refreshing. Now, that's not enough all by itself, I have to say. It's really important to get away and get exercise and uh, try not to think about work at night. Uh, that's easier said than done. Uh, but it really is fundamentally uh, renewing to me to see the people that we're working with, the volunteers who are giving their time. Uh, it just motivates me over and over and over again. Diane. Okay, so um, I was curious, I saw something that I think sort of answered it. Uh, so I volunteered like, I don't know, 25 years ago. Yeah. It's been a few years. <laughs> but one of the issues that, we, that was happening at the time was transportation was always oh, yeah. so difficult. I yeah. mean, Lincoln doesn't have horrible, but it's, you know, the, the sidewalks, the streets roll up at six, you can't get anywhere at night, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. So how have you kind of handled that? I saw the the van. Yep. So was that kind of what you all started doing? And how many vans and how does that work? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and we do have a decent bus system, but on a day that's like decent. today, yeah. <laughs> you wouldn't want to be standing at a bus stop, especially if you have a child. And many of our students bring their young children to our learning centers uh, because they have to, but also we offer free childcare and we offer free classes for the kids as well. So it's a, a really good thing for them to do, but not by catching a bus on a zero degree day. So when I was hired at the end of 2005, I took a close look at everything we were doing and we had some real serious budget challenges at that time because a major uh, grant had just expired. So I asked people who'd been on staff a while, what would happen if we stopped the van service? We had one van at that time. And they said, the people who need it most won't be able to come to class. So I thought, okay, we'll cut something else. <laughs> uh, and, and we've done it ever since. Uh, we were able to buy a newer van in 2012 and then a second van in uh, 2017. So we now have two vans that run pretty much every day that we provide service. We don't run the van on Sundays, but otherwise they're out and about. Uh, and they, uh, both fans, and especially for the morning classes that have the largest number of refugees, make multiple trips to get students to and from classes. So it is an essential part of our service. It, it, it makes it costly. Then, but yep. yes, and that was, you know, insurance and, oh, I can't even imagine the nightmares, but it's, yeah. I'm glad y'all figured it out. They Thanks, Diane. figured it out yet when I was... One other aspect of it that pleases me is that we're able to offer a first job in America to some of the refugees who come to us for oh. service. So our van drivers are all refugees and our child care workers are nearly all uh, refugees or immigrants. And uh, 
that gives them something that they can then uh, have on their resume when they go to another employer. Otherwise, uh, it's tough for employers to make a judgment about somebody whose only work experience is unverifiable and took place in another country. I think a Jody had a question. Jody had a question. Oh. Well, first of all, um, as I have a, a child that is a nurse and the CNAs, they depend on them so much. So that is such an excellent program for you guys to be having. And connecting with SCC is just brilliant because it's so affordable yeah. for students to get these basic uh, skills down. That is just, thank you. Yep, you're totally right about that. And uh, it's really opened up uh, new avenues of collaboration. We've worked with SCC for decades, but only on English language teaching up until recently. And now we're, we're, we have many other channels of uh, communication and pathways to help our adult students find career paths there. Is there a possibility of you working with like the universities or something, and they require certain things for their courses, like uh, foreign language courses. Is there a possibility of checking with them to work with, and then when they do work with you, it could count as credit for their course? Yes, uh, that's such a good question. Um, we are doing that in two ways. Uh, we, I mentioned our teacher prep program, uh, and we launched into that with great enthusiasm. And it's still going on, but it turns out that's a long, hard road. Somebody who was a teacher in another country uh, first has to pass the Praxis Core exam, uh, which is a pretty tough exam, a little bit analogous to the ACT. Well, I think it's not quite as wide in its scope, but uh, so far, none of our teacher prep students have passed all of the components of that exam. If they can do that, then they can apply uh, for a master's degree uh, at UNL in the teacher's program. And we have warm relations with them. They'll take a serious look at uh, our students. Uh, we pay for the translation of their previous education credentials. So we're looking forward to the day that that happens. We have a little bit of grant money for scholarship for that purpose. We still haven't figured out entirely how a uh, low-income student could be financed through a master's program, but it's not an immediate issue either because none of them is all that close to being ready to apply. Well, uh, actually, what I was meaning is that um, I know as students right now that they're looking at uh, going to a different country to learning, and they need a specific, um, basically for them, at the university now to come into your program and teach yep. literacy. Yep, and we that was the other aspect of it. Uh, we have regular uh, undergraduate internships with us. Some of the students uh, get credit for it and some of them just do it. We've gone to paid internships. We used to have unpaid internships, but with our growing budget and our sense that it's not fair to uh, have unpaid internships. We've changed that. So uh, some do get credit. Our latest venture is uh, we now have a contract with UNL's education department for graduate students to do a paid internship with us teaching in our workplace classes. So uh, we have an international student who's, who was an English teacher in his home country of Morocco and who's now a doctoral student at UNL, who's one of our lead instructors at Kawasaki, teaching the uh, contextual English course there. And I'm hoping that we can add more uh, like that because it's great experience for them. And it's great for us to have somebody with all those skills on the front lines. So we're building as many bridges and connections as we can. I will say that it's greatly increased the complexity of Lincoln literacy. And uh, we are, we've added a tier of senior management, but things continue to be real challenging to manage 
all those different programs and all the inevitable issues that flare up here or there uh, keeps me pretty busy. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're doing a great job. Yes. I say Lincoln Literacy has got a great reputation. In oh, Lincoln, I'm so. so pleased to hear that. I think that is our single most valuable asset. And uh, I, I hope it's, uh, we genuinely strive to make uh, our mission true, to strengthen our community by what we do. But it's always good to hear that people see it that way. I'd like to make a comment or sure. a question about uh, getting volunteers and resources. Uh, I'm one of those more mature individuals, a dyslexic 28 year old. And I read a book. <laughs> that took a moment. <laughs> we, we, sorry. We, uh, we had a speaker come in into our church, and there's a wonderful book out there called If You Pass the Baton, Take It Back. And basically, that's really talking about intergenerational. Our society is like many of the cultures around us, where they value and honor the senior citizens and the more mature people. If we're not proactive in that area ourselves in that market, it doesn't happen. But there's, to your point about having a tremendous need for finding volunteers, you might pick up that book or that resource, take a look at it. Now, there's a spiritual component to it, but but uh, it's amazing how much talent there is out there. Yeah. How so many people, well, first of all, the younger generation is actually starving. Some of these people have heard me say this before, starving for mentorship. Yes. They really are. And there's those opportunities where a lot of 28 year olds like me are afraid to reach out because they don't think, sorry, Jody. <laughs> We had that discussion last week. <laughs> it, 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 it's amazing how we don't think they value us, but the bottom line is they've been so screen driven their whole lives. And I think that's even <laughs> some of our Afghans. Yeah. My wife and I, two weeks ago, we've adopted an Afghan family at Masada and had the opportunity to take them to Blue Stem Clinic, mm. the mother and the father, and work with them. Before I could even leave with them to take, I had to sit up. We furnished their home for them. Oh, that's great. I sat on the floor. I had to sit on the floor with them and drink tea. Yeah. Before they, and that's their way of thinking. Yes. They have a very simple life, and any little bit is overwhelming to them. Anyway, I'm getting off that. Regarding the civil engineering person, yes. even though they, he may have to go back and relearn, are there opportunities for internships for him, like places like? Associates or, or any civil area. Funny, funny you should mention that. That's the first place I took him. I took him to meet a senior vice president at Olson Engineering. Yep. Yeah. But let me say that that was kind of extraordinary for me because uh, if I did that for every student that we'd have, I'd never get any of my actual work done. So if any of you is interested in dipping a toe in the volunteer <laughs> pool with us, uh, the job mentor is a relatively short-term and light-duty uh, volunteer gig that we have, and it's so valuable because we prepare people, uh, but then if they have no experience and no confidence about applying for a job here, a uh, job mentor can make all the difference, showing them how to search for a job. Uh, how to prepare a resume, doing some interview practice, and then just encouraging them, maybe giving them tips, apply here, as you just suggested, uh, that kind of thing. So if that's of interest at all, uh, please uh, follow up with me and I'll connect you with our staff who oversee that. Uh, it can be a really valuable service. We just got a job mentor for that young man I mentioned because I gave him a start, but I can't continue to help him. Uh, but we do have a volunteer job mentor for him. And, and, and with that, at a certain point, they have to become proactive on their own, even though there's some barriers for them to have to overcome. For sure. And we don't expect a job mentor to hold their hand and go right up to the counter and <laughs> fill out the form. It's more of an online, you know, once a week uh, check-in sort of thing. But yes, the 
ultimately it's up to the students to uh, make a successful pathway for themselves. All right, we have, uh, anybody have one final question? Great, I do. <laughs> Tell us, do you have a favorite local restaurant or local business that you like to frequent? Ooh, it's tough to name a single favorite restaurant. If you twisted my arm, I'd probably say the oven in the Haymarket. Ooh, yes. I love Indian food, but I also love Blue Orchid, Thai food, and um, I... Misty's is a sentimental favorite. Uh, my wife's three sons all worked there at various times in their <laughs> lives. Uh, but uh, as for small businesses, uh, my, my main connection with them is through those that support us in one way or another. And I got to say, when I moved to Lincoln in 1996, uh, I was trying to figure out what the character of this community is. And then uh, that freak October blizzard hit and there were 10,000 oh, wow. trees down in Lincoln yep. and many thoroughfares were blocked. And I got it right there. I th this place has such great civic spirit. Everybody banded together, neighbors helped neighbors. Uh, on the larger scale, the city uh, worked swiftly to clear things up. I mean, I was so impressed. And I've never stopped being impressed. So the small businesses here exhibit that civic spirit uh, as much as individual citizens do. And uh, it just, it makes me so glad to live here. My wife was born and raised here and sometimes she laments not having lived anywhere else. But I said, honey, you had the bad luck to be born in the best place to live. What can I tell you? <laughs> Sure, we go on vacation here or there, but I'm not leaving Lincoln. <laughs> and we're glad to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you so much for your time, Clayton. My pleasure, truly. Thank you all. I really appreciate being invited. It's great this to talk with wonderful. you. wonderful. Come back anytime or if there's anything that um, we can help with, help connect you with, just let us know. And all right. Thanks very much. And I'll yeah. just put my email in the chat in case Perfect. anybody wants to follow up. Thank you.